Hi everyone. I've recently done a, a develop, or I've done one house out of three, or sorry, one and a half houses out of three of a development, and I feel that potentially being an architect developer gives Whispering Smith and me a unique perspective on exactly what the current planning regime is is delivering um, us in terms of sustainable development or quality urban infill, um, and to kind of talk about that experience we decided that we would do a stick man cartoon because it's a lot funnier than the actual story. So it's called A Tale of Two, de two Developers. We've got Blue and Green. Both of them buy the same property, same price, same location one day. Blue is a business as usual development. Green wants a quality urban infill development. And we've got some rainbows and some dollar signs. Now that's not to say that the rainbow guy doesn't want the dollar signs as well. It's just not the key and primary driver of um, that type of development. So blue flattens the block. He thinks that that's amazing. Uh, green keeps the existing trees and buildings. Um, and he thinks that, or he or she, thinks that that looks amazing. Blue submits a typical project home design to council. You know the one you've seen it all many times. The design has been submitted 15 times already, so it goes through without a hitch. The planners love this sort of stuff. Um, they sort of love it and they sort of hate it. I mean, it, they're being pushed for efficiency, so having something that they've seen before, something that fits the block, something that fits in with the R codes, goes straight through, deemed to comply, that's something that seems to be a pos gets a positive outcome, and sometimes the planners want to use the controls to control that particular type of development but they can't um, and so often that thing just gets a tick no matter how good or bad it is. So green has to design around the existing trees and buildings and the council find it hard to understand the unusual design and so too do the residents like they're looking at something that doesn't look the way that all of the other projects look and so often there's you know complaints you can get taken to council um you can you know your, your sort of pathway if you're trying to do something unique or different or sustainable um, or quality is a really really slow pathway so if you um happen to be funding that development on your own and you're looking at a really really slow process you're looking at like i don't know for us it was four grand a month so every month that we had that was delayed four grand just went out of my wallet um, and so there goes your solar panels, there goes your rain tanks, there goes all those things that you were keen to invest in because you've spent so much time dragging the chain through planning. So wait here while we find you a planner with, sus with sustainable development expertise because no one in there has any idea what you're talking about. I mean the level of knowledge at planning level um, is, is, you know, you're meeting someone who doesn't have as much training as you in the architectural field. Um, or whether or in the landscape field or any of those other fields. So, Blue subdivided and raised equity on the empty block. The bank gave him, or her, a full loan. Because of the requirements for the existing dwelling to be R code compliant, Green was unable to subdivide or raise equity. So, the banks love Blue. He is amazing, or she. Well done, Blue. With all your subdivisions and pre-sales, you get to loan all of the money that you need. Whereas Green looks like a real idiot because he's gone in, taken ages to council, um, and oh dear Green, your subdivisions, get your subdivisions through first and then we can loan you all the money that you need. So for us, because we couldn't get subdivisions up front because of the planning scheme, um, because we kept the existing house and we kept the existing trees, um, we couldn't subdivide up front and we were only giving a tiny little sack of money to do our project, whereas this guy gets all of it. Also, it's really difficult to pre-sale a project that's like that's a good urban infill development, especially if you've kept existing things and you've worked around it. It's not something that's stock standard that you can stick on a flyer and say this is off the plan. Um, and so, therefore, the, the whole business as usual or the pressure um, on you to be a business as usual developer is immense in the financial department. So Green, who's still trying to keep the trees and the house, um, gets a list of subdivision requirements from the council and starts saving pocket money to pay for them because, remember, no loan. This takes time. Blue is on holidays. 
this is this actually happened. So Green pays for a paved driveway to the council's satisfaction to the existing dwelling. So if you have an existing dwelling, it has to be R code compliant through the entire development. And it doesn't matter whether that house is uninhabited, has no roof, uh, like, you know, whether there's trucks rolling up the driveway to do the back house is irrelevant. When you go for subdivision, you must have a fully finished driveway. So we went for three, two, three subdivisions, three lots. And so we needed three driveways. So Green pays for a paved driveway to the council's satisfaction. As soon as the council approved the driveway, Green throws it in the bin because the construction will ruin it anyway. Super sustainable policy, that one. So still going with the many driveways. Green builds the walls to plate height. So we did a single bedroom development, a single bedroom dwelling. So if anyone knows the R codes, that means that you actually can't subdivide that lot straight up. You have to build the house, half the house with your own money first, and then they will give you um, the subdivision when they come and check that you haven't built something that's bigger than what you put in. So Green builds the walls to plate height, builds a temporary storage shed. Sorry, you've always got to have storage to your existing dwelling. So we went on Gumtree, bought the worst shed that money could buy, pinned it together with two screws, and then um, yeah, just after the planner left to tick off the thing, it, it blew over. Um, <laughs> you know, hey, we got it. So, um, so we built the, the temporary storage shed, paid for another driveway to comply with the council condition for the second subdivision. This is taking eons, by the way. Um, so the last one that was really, really hurtful, so we had this cute existing little house on the, on the site and um, the, only, the only way that we could get the subdivision for the, the third subdivision was to have a car space to the existing one because we'd built our new house over the old car space and now we had only a small amount of area left and we had to basically chop the front of the house off to put in this car space. So we made the house totally unlivable, but you know what, as long as you can park your cars in front of it, that's all that matters. So Green must also demolish the porch to build a car space for the existing house. Green pays the council's lawyers, that's also really hurts that one when you're, you know, you're pretty broke already, uh, to put a restrictive covenant, covenant on the title for subdivision. So that means if you decide to sell your single bedroom lot, it has on the title that's a single bedroom lot and therefore it means forevermore that no one else will ever sleep in it. <laughs> but you've paid a fortune for that. Green then throws the temporary car space in the bin again. Congratulations Blue, here are your profits. My word, you are a terrific developer. Do you need any more loans? So that is that is Blue Hat. He's killed it. He's done his trip legs. It's all over. He's stoked. Oh, dear Green, now that your house was half demolished, has a half demolished porch, it's almost worthless. We can only give you part of your loan again. So to put the car space in, you have to stuff up your existing dwelling. And when you stuff up your existing dwelling, the banks come out to you and they go, that thing is a piece of shit and it's worth nothing. So then the thing that you're supposed to use to give you your money to do the development is officially shot to bits. Blue receives the profits from the sale of the development. Green now has the subdivisions and asks the bank for a loan. Unfortunately, the property was wrecked to comply with the R codes and it is now worth much less. So here's a little graph of what it looks like to be green and blue. So blue does two developments in five years because he's going bang, DA, bang, subdivide, finance, build, sells, and then he's into profit, so he's pretty much building number two with his own money, he or she, sorry. <laughs> sell, DA, subdivide, finance, build, sell, and it just keeps going in a, like a trajectory into space. Whereas this poor person here, uh, who's trying to do good urban infill in Perth, has a absolute rainbow slide all the way down to the bottom and then by the time they've paid all that money in fees to the bank while they wait for all this stuff to happen they get to sell and unless they sell for an astronomical amount of money potentially probably won't make any profit so blue does two developments in five years green struggles to get finance and subdivisions and has not completed the first development true i've only done one and a half houses out of three so, Blue does 40 developments and buys a Lexus. Green goes broke and never develops again. 
If green hat slash quality urban infill is what we all want, why did the council and the state government not support it? Interesting question. Because <laughs> of this guy, the R codes. So if there's people in the room know this document quite well. I'm going to presume that would be a company. Because the state planning policy is a top-down strategic document that isn't informed by industry feedback and leaves the outcome up to the individual. The word sustainability is written twice in the R codes. It's once somewhere right up at the beginning and then it also refers to like solar panels and collectors at some point. So we're talking about something, delivering something in our everyday lives, we all talk to each other about it, that doesn't exist in this document at all. It's not referred to, it's like it's not even real. So that's probably step one. But the reason that it's not real and it doesn't exist is because our industries that we all work in were not part of the writing of it, or if they were part of the writing of it, they had no power in the writing of it. So, right now there are two separate planning policies in consideration by state government at the moment. One is top down, the other one is ground up. So we have blues, business as usual, current, green paper that's out at the moment and then we have the apartment design guidelines or design in WA which was written and delivered in conjunction over five years with developers, with planners, with architects, with landscape architects, with workshops, with collaboration and it is an awesome document. This thing on the other hand I don't know who's been engaged with that but it certainly isn't any one of our built environment professions as far as I can tell. So. Business as usual. One approach being five years in the making and regulates quality urban infill and the other is business as usual. So these are some of the kind of diagrams that you can expect from the green paper. It's all, you know, green triangle facing up, facing down, house, clipboard, click, and then, you know, Fairness and transparency and integrity and efficiency. There's no sustainable. It's not even written there. We looked it up. There was 39 examples of the word sustain or sustainable. And most of those went to a page where they were saying that the word, that sustainability hasn't really been defined yet. And they'll spend some time defining it in this document. Like it doesn't already exist. Um, so then the urban, the quality urban infill version. You've got diagrams that we as professionals all completely understand what this is. You've got deep root zones. That one's about ventilation. This one's about natural light. Right? So, modernising Western Australia's planning system. So this is the urban infill development that's being proposed to us in this green paper right now. This is how it's going to happen. You're going to take a bunch of green houses and then you're going to jam them into a bunch of other houses. Um, so it's a top-down planning reform. If a top-down planning reform is implemented, quality urban info will remain up to the individual. So there's nothing in this document that says in any way how we're going to deliver it, how we're going to change the existing system to deliver it. Um, and I think that having been a person who's tried to get through with the existing system, it is so difficult to operate under a set of guidelines when your particular product that you were trying to put out there as a developer isn't recognised at all. And what this is saying is, you know, don't be fooled by the colour. That's just another house that's getting jammed down there. It doesn't matter whether it's blue hat or green hat or who, who cares, you know? So, if you stand with green hat development, if sustainable housing matters to you, then you are going to have to fight for it. Comments on this green paper close on July the 20th, 2018. So, I strongly encourage you to do your own research in this like I have. Um, I got the green paper, I read it. The first time I read it, I thought, actually, that kind of doesn't sound too bad. Extreme money planning. There's all these things that sucked about my process, but maybe if it was streamlined, it would be better. And in the end, when you read the design in WA documents and it says, you know, this is how we're going to achieve the building that we want to see, it just makes so much sense. Like, you can't, you know, 
arrow speech bubble push your way in. That's that's a very very individual way of looking at how planning can deliver something and planning doesn't deliver stuff on its own it has to actually um, dictate what that outcome should be and make it easier for someone who's doing a green hat development and make it harder for someone who's doing a blue that's the only way that you will shift the whole development industry from one side to the other so the author of the reform green planning paper his name is Evan Jones. I don't have a problem saying that because I can't be fired from anything. Um, this is some of the shit that he's been saying in some of his public... So I just looked his name up and the slap that on third or even fourth on the Google um, search was a bunch of talks that this guy has done. This is what he thinks about architects and professionals. Too often, architects perceive obligations to make every building a creative landmark over the appropriateness and contexts that are so important in making responsive and compatible places. The professions, guilds, so that's engineers, landscape architects, urban planners, have become both specialised and compartmentalised and provide arbitra sorry, arbitrary and artificial barriers to making good places. This is the dude who is writing the next 20 years of our history in the built environment in Perth. So, planning reform without the input of architects and other built environment professionals isn't planning reform, it's business as usual. So, here's some cute pictures of my house <laughs> <laughs> to calm you all down. <laughs> I'll have a sip on my beer while you look at that beautiful example of urban infill. So, yeah, I can flick through this. A lot of greenery. We kept that tree. It's a point cook pine. I think um, someone on site asked me to cut that tree down at least three times a week. <laughs> Plumber can't dig around it. The roots are too big. Planners hated it. Everyone tried to get rid of it and now it's like one of my favourite things on the whole development. Um, this is the existing context around it. Obviously it doesn't fit in with that idea of what Perth is, and I think I've said on an Instagram post who decided that Perth was a terracotta roofed place and is, was that person from Spain because I'm not really <laughs> sure why that's why we look that way, but you know. Um, and so, if you just a little bit of background on House A is that we carved off that 175 square metre lot that took us years to subdivide, um, but the result is pretty awesome. We have a 70 square metre plot ratio. Um, that we live in as a young couple and um, we have sort of a separate space at the end of that that we, you know, I've sort of, when I was trying to do all of this stuff, I ran Whispering Smith out of that space because I couldn't afford an office um, and my partner is a, has a landscape business and he ran it out of there as well um, and we can have as many friends over as we want, basically we've had events in that house, we've had talks in that house like this um, and for something that's only the size of a single bedroom apartment, it's pretty nice. Like it, um, it operates in the most impressive way um, and to think that we don't have anything, to think that it was so hard to get it through because there is no reference to this kind of outcome in any of our planning codes is horrifying and to think that we might go through another 20 years like, like this one is also pretty sad. Um, so this is the plan of our tiny little guy. So the garage underneath, it's like a three-storey tower. Um, garage underneath, we have our living all on the, on the lower level and then we have a sleeping mezzanine upstairs. Um, and our kitchen and our living room open right out into that courtyard space um, so that we can live a pretty good life in a really tiny area. Um, that's a little plan of it. Um, section. This is little old house B. So this is the house that had to have parking attached to it and this is what it looked like at all of the times um, you know apart from the time where it had just a there was nothing on the block but this derelict house and then a 90 metre long um, paved driveway to nowhere um, yeah so that's that's it I might just go back to this one and finish on that so if um Cool. Okay, so first I'd like to thank Mordrick for letting me be so opinionated in here. <laughs>
And I urge you all just to get heavily engaged in the planning system because they are about to take your livelihood away as an architect and I think it's time we did something about that. Thank you.